evening, everyone. This is a first of a three-part series that is to examine what I learned about the Black experience during the United States shutdown. This is produced by Gwen Weber McLeod, and it is a part of the Auburn Public Theater's celebration of Black History Month. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Anita Wright, or for short, Dr. Nina. I was a teacher for 30 years in universities and colleges. I am a social worker and a credentialed alcoholism counselor. I'm currently writing a book on Harriet Tubman's life in Auburn. I wanna thank the panelists for coming here tonight to share their experience to answer the question, what I learned about the Black experience during the United States shutdown. I'm gonna ask each one of them in turn to introduce themselves in terms of what they do now or what they did do or what takes up their time now. I hope that you enjoy this panel. Bob, would you unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please? Introduce yourself, please. Uh Thank you, uh, Dr. Wright. Uh, my name uh, is Bob Bergen. Um, I'm the person in the, the, the setup for this uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, kind of a scary picture. Um, and that was when I uh, was a practicing lawyer, which I uh, graduated from uh, at the end of this past year. Uh, but I practiced law uh, in Auburn for 39 years. Um, I'm from Auburn and I'm very happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Dave Connolly. Dave, unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> lip reading, everybody needs to be able to look at the lip reader at this. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from the West Coast originally, uh, came here to, uh, to edit the newspaper 35 some years ago. I did that for seven or eight years and then did another publication. I have about 35 years in the news business before uh, this. Um, I did a period of, uh, uh, um, uh, getting on buses to take people on tours around the Finger Lakes, around Central New York at one point. And uh, now I'm teaching philosophy over at the community college, mostly ethics, world religions, and some other philosophy courses. Thank you, Dave. And could Dan Fisher please introduce himself? Sure thing, Dr. Nita. <clears throat> so I'm Dan Fisher. I uh, was born in Auburn Memorial Hospital many, many years ago. Um, after working 35 years as the uh, head of HR at Well Challenge, um, I left uh, with the acquisition back in 2015 and uh, I've been pretty busy. I chair a small company board, uh, companies outside of Philadelphia, chair the Community Foundation uh, board um, I've uh, become a student of political reform, and I've recently become aligned with Unite America. Um, and I do some part-time work for Cornell, uh, supporting their executive masters in HR. And Dave Tobin, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, thanks, Nina. Um, I uh, grew up in Syracuse, but um, I lived uh, about 10 years in Auburn and worked another 15 in Auburn. So I feel like Auburn is my second home, almost my first home. I was a journalist. I've written a couple books. Um, I'm sort of a jack of all trades uh, and I'm currently overseeing a reforestation project in the town of Marcellus. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. So now to the question. The question is, what did you learn about the Black experience during the shutdown for COVID-19? What I'd like you to be able to do is to, to get that answer out in about five or six minutes, and I'll let you know when you're getting close, and then we'll move on from there. 
What I'd like is if Bob would be willing to start. Uh, yes, of course, um, Dr. Wright, thank you. And um, once again, this, uh, it, I'm grateful to uh, be here. Um, so what, what I can tell you uh, about what I learned during the pandemic about the Black experience is this. Um, I, uh, what, when the lockdown started, I uh, wanted to do something to help. So I became a Meals on Wheels uh, volunteer once a week. <clears throat> and um, uh, the, the area that I delivered to uh, included parts of Auburn, it was all in the city of Auburn, that um, included uh, a number of affordable housing uh, units. Um, and as <clears throat> I, you know, did the deliveries uh, week after week, uh, I, you know, I couldn't help but notice that some of the folks who I delivered to probably uh, quite a bit younger than me uh, were uh, in just in bad physical shape, you know, in a wheelchair, um, oxygen tube, um, and it, I realized that more of the people who I saw who had serious medical issues were people of color. And then after the delivery, I, I'd go to the next stop uh, and I'd be listening to the news on the radio. And this was uh, after uh, the murder of Rodney K uh, King. And uh, so the whole issue of the black experience was in the news. And, um, you know, what I put together was I realized that even though I am, my, my mind is for whatever needs to be done uh, for equality, equality is the goal. Um, I realized that having been born and schooled in Auburn, um, then I left for 10 years or so and return to start practicing law um, was that I grew up in a completely segregated way. I went to Herman Avenue School, which is still uh, a, a school, elementary school, and there was not one person of color in the school for the entire six years that I was there seven and then uh in back in those days there were four high schools in the city of auburn and because of where i lived i went to east high i don't believe there was a person of color in east high when i was there um and um so what you know what i worry or what I wonder about, what I contemplate is at, at what age did I become responsible for being aware of the, you know, I, apartheid is too strong a word, but a, a segregated way of life that I didn't um, consciously contribute to, but it was it was just there. That uh, it was the the rails that I walked between growing up, and so I I, I, I 
you know, it, it's opened up new doors for me to walk through and try to understand so that I can be a, a, a more positive uh, actor in um, making things better. So thanks. Thanks so thanks much, Bob. so much, Bob. Dave Conley, could you answer the question? What did I learn about the Black experience during the shutdown for COVID-19? Unmute yourself, David. What I learned, what I learned is, uh, I think more about myself than about somebody else. Um, I have been aware of race and the and issues of race since as far back as I can remember. Uh, raised in a racist family, uh, a man who was homophobic, racist, anti-Semitic, um, you know, and uh, I love my dad, but it was, it was my background. Um, you know, I think it was when I had a black roommate in college that I began to realize that there was something wrong with this because the man was a good man. Um, and uh, I, I had a long ride with him from uh, San Francisco Bay Area all the way down to LA. It's about six hours with him and about and five of his friends. I was the only white guy in the, in the car. And it was funny how my attitudes began to shift. But it wasn't only, it was the last year or so that really, this really affected me. Uh, the George Floyd uh, murder was beyond the pale. Um, you know, re recent um, uh, Armad uh, 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 Arbery, uh, conviction is interesting, but what is what has happened to me is a kind of a I don't know if this is quite the right way to put it, but it's kind of I'm coming out of the closet, um, in the sense that, well, you know, actually, uh, Nina, you helped me with this. I, I think the first time I said this was to you about six or eight months ago. Uh, I know at my age, I began to realize that I have a racist bone in my body. Uh, you can't just I just can't change from what my upbringing was. And I've come to think that it's uh, the many of us white guys are there, um, as I've always been. And the fact is, um, I, I hate it. I, there's something about me I really don't like. Um, I'm not proud of it. Uh, and in fact, I think I've been denying it uh, for most of my, my years. And I, uh, you know, in my conversations with you, I began to realize, and maybe because you're so open, um, you know, there I am telling you something I'm not at all proud of. And of course, I don't expect you to be proud of me either for it. You know, what surprises me is that as soon as I say that, uh, it was like a relief on your face. Uh, we were with a young woman from Howard University, and I could see it in her too. And it's like, all right, uh, <laughs> uh, something I'm not proud of um, about myself, but uh, apparently... Uh, people of color already know this about me and know this about just about all of us. Uh, and uh, to have somebody admit it, uh, turns out it might be a good thing, but I'm not proud of it. You know, I, I still don't feel very good about it. In fact, I think probably I ought to join something like an AA group, you know, where we start off and the first thing we say is, uh, I'm a racist and I don't like it. <laughs> uh, and we can support each other. I, I know I, I'm thinking about those three guys who were just convicted in Georgia of committing, of killing uh, Aubrey. I'm wondering if, they, if they're actually seeing him any different and realizing that the reason that they did this is that they were together doing the opposite of what a, a, an AA group would be doing with alcoholism. Instead of admitting that they're alcoholics, they're proud of the fact that they're alcoholics and they're going out and they're drinking all the time and building it up and supporting themselves. Uh, it's like the opposite. So I have to say, I guess uh, I'm coming out of the closet. I'm an alcoholic. I have this, <laughs> I have this uh, bias. Uh, I can, I'm, you know, I've been dealing with it for years by compensating. It's, you know, I'm looking at a, uh, I'm looking at a. Uh, a black male, particularly, I don't know. I look at him, I look at it as kind of a, the other, somebody who's different, I don't altogether trust. Right away, I check myself and I say, no, wait a second, you're better than that. You're learning that people of color 
are like yourself, hold the same values, want to be respected, want to be loved, uh, and need to, and need your attention and your concern. As soon as I do that, the relationship changes. But there's this moment that I'm not proud of. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, David. I'd like to go to Dan Fisher now. David, please mute yourself. Thank you. Sure enough, Dr. Nina. So <clears throat> I have to say that I'm still early in my journey. I think I have quite a ways to go. Um, and my hope is that I can make a difference, you know, in what's left of my life in a lot of different ways. And this is, this is one area. So in the summer of 2020, I wrote an essay, mostly to myself. And the first sentence of the essay is, I'm a class migrant. And I said that because um, I grew up um, in a working class family <clears throat> and by hook or by crook and all the things that I thought I did and the, the values I had and choices I made, uh, was able to become an executive and was in an executive position at a great company for, you know, 35 years. And um, in the essay, I step back to think about, well, how did I get to where I got? And, um, you know, I looked uh, at uh, the hard work um, and all the things that I did to, to, to get there. So in, in working through the essay, uh, I came to a different conclusion. While I might have said, gee, good choices, hard work, a little bit of luck, you got to where you are. Um, after doing a, a lot of research, looking at a lot of statistics, it's very clear that the experience of someone um, uh, going through life, that grows up in the south side of Syracuse or a rough neighborhood, um, you know, has a very different experience. Um, in you can look at income, wealth, health, longevity, uh, infant mortality. I mean, you look at any, any of these statistics and there's a, a tremendous difference between being white and being black. And the bottom line of the research I did is that it's all about the zip code in which you were born and your race. And um, those are huge predictors of success. So I've had to reconsider the coaching that I had as a sixth grader from my sixth grade teacher, um, working for a gentleman par uh, farmer at age 14, um, summer jobs at the chemical plant where my father worked, working another summer in a plant that a friend of my uh, father, a friend of mine had, different earn internships, contacts, all the way through. Um, it wasn't uh, all hard work. It was contacts, connections, and a lot of luck. And as I went through this process, there were a couple things that um, I, I wanted to share that um, I, I picked up. I listened to Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast of a panel of black intellectuals who were disagreeing on many things about racial equity. But one thing that they, they did agree with was that those who have good luck hoard it and bad luck is disproportionately experienced by Blacks. Um, Emmanuel Acho had a series of podcasts uh, where he talked about uh, white and Black experience. And he was talking to uh, uh, McConaughey, I can't think of his first name, the actor. And he said, look at, you know, if life is a race, Blacks start out 200 meters short of the, the starting line. And, um, you know, the need to look at the opportunities and removal of barriers to make it a fair race. So I guess the bottom line of my experience in taking a deep dive, researching, talking, reading books, podcasts, and so forth is that there isn't an equal opportunity, there is not an equal opportunity to succeed, period. And um, we all have some responsibility for that. I've many more things to say, but I think I'm probably running short of time. We'll give you more time later, Dan. Thank you. David, could you answer that question? What did you learn about the Black experience during the shutdown for COVID-19? Um, I was very lucky. Um, 
at the start of shutdown to be part of a panel, a previous panel at APT, um, addressing um, white privilege. Um, and uh, sort of the similar format to this, there were three sessions and the, uh, the third session was uh, both white and black participants speaking with each other and strangely, it was very intimate, you know, via Zoom and uh, very moving um, and yeah, raised uh, these questions that other people have talked about when a white man considers where he is and how he got there and what he knows about uh, the black experience. I had always considered myself well-read, liberal-minded, open-minded. Um, and I guess one of the discoveries for me is that um, all that had kind of been in my head and uh, through the panel and then subsequently, I dove into black literature, black uh, cinema, uh, black theater, and I took it to heart. I put myself in the experience that was not mine, but that is experienced every day um, by especially black men uh, in this country. Um, you know, I, uh, again, intellectually, I, I look back and I think that uh, say a, a movie of black life in the 40s was a snapshot. Things have moved on since then. Um, but as that year revealed, first with Ahmed Arbery, then George Floyd, it hasn't changed. Um, the iterations might have changed. The, the way things are uh, uh, shifted and shielded and covered and masked change. Uh, but the underlying racism is like, it's uh, what the country was built upon. And it's as much as the racist bones are in our bodies, uh, the racist bones are in uh, the architecture of this country. Um, and so I'll, it's hard for me, it was really hard for me to sit with that. And uh, so an opportunity came uh, this past year to uh, help a candidate in Cuga County, the first African-American who uh, he was elected in November, Brian Muldrow. Um, and uh, in some ways, while I was involved in that campaign, things got better. I had a focus. I had action. Uh, I didn't have to uh, tear my hair out thinking like what to do. There was this purpose. And uh, so the campaign ended. Brian won. And uh, I'm sort of back to tearing my hair out. So I'll stop there. Thank you, David. So <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to ask is, all of you talked about this revelation or many revelations, I should say. Is there anything that you heard from any other panelists that you need to know deeper about, that you have a question about? Is there anything that anyone said that was not clear about what they were saying to you? I just wanna give you a chance to to follow up with anything that people have said to this point. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. Uh, may, uh, if I may. Um, uh, first, I, I want to uh, correct uh, when I was talking, I um, forgot, you know, terrible, forgot the name George Floyd. 
um, but I, I'm generally forgetful. Um, I, I can hide my own Easter eggs, you know, for example. So, but I do want to correct that. And my, I wanted to ask uh, Dave Conley, uh, you know, for, uh, I just appreciate the way you um, expressed yourself. And I'm, I'm wondering now that you you have made that realization about yourself do you see that it is improving or is you know do you are you washing it out um or does it remain thanks that's a good question robert thank you um <laughs> no i uh you uh, you know, I, I, I'm more conscious now uh, of what's happening to me. Uh, I see a black student, I don't know, and my immediate reaction is probably having trouble. I go through a whole, you know, stereotype thing, and I have to stop and I have to say, I have to remind myself. In fact, this, you know, thinking about what I, we were going to say today, um, I began to realize that, um, that I need to affirm some things. I need to go beyond just imagining what I've said. I need to affirm some things. I need to affirm not just black people, but everybody I meet, um, that they're respected, that they're cared for, that they're people who deserve the love that they should be getting. Um, but it's not automatic. And my problem is, uh, you know, my problem is that I'm, uh, it's there and I don't like it. I'm not proud of it. In fact, I'm a little worried, you know, if my shtick now becomes in, in, in trying to deal with racism becomes just owning up all the time to this racist bone in my body. I don't know whether I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to last at that. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to get any better. I mean, and what, you know, the painful thing about it, the realization, I think the painful thing, thing is that uh, as David Tobin is saying, uh, it's institutional. I mean, it's it's embedded. I don't think I'm alone in this. I can only talk about my own experience, but I don't think I'm alone in this. And if uh, you know, if 75 or 50 percent even uh, of of American males do this, well, we're in deep trouble. And I mean, the, my my hope is that I have a 20 year old son. Uh, you know, we brought up without raising any issues like this. Not talking about it. And my son now, when I try to talk to him about race, my wife and I have done this. He doesn't get it. He's not interested because his friends are black. And, you know, it's just it, it, for him, this, this bone is not in his body. I guess I can say that makes me happy about that. So I think a generation is coming up with a larger proportion that doesn't have this, the problem that I have. But I, I don't think it, for me it's going to go away. I think I'm going to die with it. Any other questions for other panelists? I guess I have a question for David. You said that you think you're going to die with it. You don't think that there's anything that can help you uh, exercise it. Well, exercise it. Well, hanging around the likes of you help. <laughs> Be for, being forgiven. You know, being forgiven helps. Although I don't, you know, as soon as a person forgives me for, for that bone, uh, I'm also a reminder of, of, of many, many, many others like me who uh, don't realize what they're doing. So in a way, I'm representing something also that is really horrible. And that I don't make me feel good about that. You know, I, I'm not going to beat myself up any more than to say, and I don't think about this all the time. You know, I don't think I need psychiatric help. <laughs> But, uh, but it does help me. I think it's helping me to see this and, and to know that um, my, uh, my success, if I'm going to have any success at dealing with anti-racism, is not going to be anything I say to a person of color, except personally in my life. But it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, opening myself up to others to say, look, I'm like you are. You don't, don't you think there's something wrong? with treating another human being as less than 
uh, less than you are? Don't you think there's something wrong? I mean, I'm think, I keep, my mind is on these three guys who killed uh, Aubrey. Oh my God. You know, they, they've heard a lot since then. You know, I, you know, somebody needs to do a study of these guys. They've heard a hell of a lot since they killed that man. And, and it's been all terrible and it gets worse and worse for them. I'm not feeling sorry for them at all. But, you know, is, is there an eye opening occurring with these guys? that they realize how horrible it is to treat another human being. I mean, we are by nature, I teach philosophy, you know, I teach ethics. And one of the, Aristotle is talking about human nature and human nature is, uh, is, res is based, built in a respecting to human beings, loving other human beings, just built in. It's things that happen to our lives that break it down. Well, these guys violated basic human nature. What, of course, they, what they're thinking is he's an animal, you know, that he's su subhuman or, you know, he's something else. But even, you know, we treat dogs better than those guys treated that man. You know, if he ever comes to, if those men ever realize that these guys, that, that Aubrey was a human being like them with the same values, the same needs to be respected and loved, just like him, them, they're going to, they're, it's going to, it'll be self-destructive them i mean they're gonna you know talk about need for help well i'm not in that category whatsoever you know at least i'm trying to do my bit so i i'm not going to beat myself up any more than i have to but i'm i would just say i, I you know i don't feel good about that part of myself thanks david for sharing dan you have something to say i sure do um i struggled you know and i continue to struggle with why the racism is so deep and so institutionalized in the country. And I just wanted to share something that I read that really made it stick. And thinking about the context of the country from day one back to 1619, um, you know, the people coming to the, uh, this country or this land for religious purposes. So let me just read this if, if I might. Heather McGee, the author of The Sum of Us, describes what she learned from Reverend Jim Wallace, a white evangelical minister about his conversation with the leaders of major white Christian denominations in the US. He told them, quote, you all have been told or taught or learned how slavery was common and slavery was all over the world, but we uniquely did something. We Christians, in fact, British and American, were the ones who decided that we couldn't do to, to, to indigenous people and kidnap Africans what we were doing if they were indeed people made in the image of God. So we said they weren't. They weren't humans made in the image of God. What we did is we threw away Imago Day. We threw it away to justify what we were doing. White supremacy was America's original sin. At the heart of the sin was a lie, he said. As long as white people, even you know, good-hearted, well-meaning, progressive white people, think that the issue of race is mostly about people of color and minorities, and what has happened to them and what happens to them that we could help with, as long as that's the mindset, we're still stuck. And I have to say that was one of the strongest few sentences of the, the many things that I've read that because I was trying to understand how could this be so deeply ingrained in the US the way it is? And, um, you know, we, we have hope in the next generation, you know, our kids don't have necessarily the same, um, the, the same issues. Uh, anyway, I just thought I would share that. So Dan, just to come back to that, when you read that, what did that mean to you about how you think, as well as how you can help others think differently? Well, it's a very interesting question because at the same time I read that, I was also reading people who were suggesting that it's a stronger play to call in rather than call out. And this whole idea, so with my business background and uh, some of the institutions I've been involved in and I'm currently involved in, um, I'm trying to be more focused on what's the business case for dealing with social and economic injustice. And my God, it's easy, right? You've got 
millions of people that are not, you know, fully engaged in our economy. They're not fully engaged, you know, adding uh, the kind of value that they could, the potential that they have, the human potential that they have. So it's a, a marrying of the need we have for human resources to be stronger than they are today in the US, marrying that up with people who need opportunity, need the barriers knocked down and so forth. So it, it, it makes me think, look, I can't change people. I can't change how they think, how they feel, what's in their heart. But maybe a, a more, a, another strategy is to, to, what's the business case, you know, for moving forward. and. Um, the, uh, I became familiar through my engagement with the Community Foundation with the Kellogg study with respect to this. And they act, the title of their document is actually making the, the business case. Um, there was also the, uh, the guy who's the Federal Reserve Chair in Atlanta uh, wrote a number of articles in the Wall Street or editorials in the Wall Street Journal. And he made a similar uh, case guys, let's step back. We can't change people, but we need to change the social and economic injustice that's out there. And we can make the country, all boats rise, right? You have more people making money, paying taxes, investing, buying products, all boats rise. You know, this idea that, you know, if we give some to help others, we're taking away is just bullshit. And we have to, we have to break through that. So anyway, that, that is kind of my reaction to it. Your thoughts, David, on what you've heard so far. Is there anything you want to add to um, David Tobin? Yes, Tobin, yes. Um, the, the issue for me as I became aware and confronted this is... <clears throat> Um, what can I do? Um, and that's still the issue. And I think it's the issue for all of us. It's like, what can we do, <clears throat> you know, beyond schooling ourselves, beyond, um, the introspection. I mean, that's all like baseline stuff, but then what do we do? Um, because, <clears throat> you know, we're the cogs in this system. Um, and, uh, maybe it's not, um, really momentous, uh, you know, at this stage of our lives, all of us seem to be, uh, <laughs> So I have moved out of our executive positions or our, 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 uh, our working positions, you know, where we were engaged every day. Uh, but, uh, and, and I think that, I think that's been the question. That's been the question, like for, let's say 200 years. Uh, David, I was thinking maybe this question could be rephrased in a way that would be easier to answer. I was thinking about this with Dan, but then, uh, you and uh, Bob could see this. Um, I wonder what, for instance, Dan, you as an HR person, when you started 35 or 40 years ago, uh, would do differently based on what you now know. And, you know, we say the same thing to you, Robert and David, when you first started going, now that you know what you know, would you do anything differently? Yes, <laughs> there would be things that I would do differently. And it's a very long list. But um, in this regard, I mean, I think it would be creating role models um, to go into the community as, as one thing, to go into the community. I, let me read one more, I'll stop reading, but one more thing I'd like to read and then I'll, I'll stop reading. So this guy, John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope, commented that, um, this is just, I'll just dive in. He said, every week for a month, a white banker in a natty suit and a red tie would come to his fourth grade class 
to lecture about credit, debt, interest, and savings. <laughs> And, and Brian's reaction was, this guy was like from Mars. And at some point, Brian mustered the courage to ask the lecturer how he got rich legally. And the man explained that he was a banker who financed entrepreneurs. Boom, I never heard that word before, but I decided that that's what I would become, an entrepreneur. That is the way out. And he went on to create this not-for-profit organization, Operation Hope, that teaches financial literacy, improves credit scores, and facilitates loans for people. So I think that, uh, David, I guess I would probably get more involved, you know, in the community and work with other organizations. You know, I look at what Meg O'Connell is doing, you know, the Allen Foundation uh, in the city, what the uh, other organizations that the city is doing in Syracuse to engage the community and all the different organizations in the community to, to deal with this issue and face up to it. But I don't know, that's a start. I, that's just the start. I could go on for a little David, I'm gonna go back to you, David Tobin, and see if you have anything else to say. You're muted. You're, You're muted, muted, David. Muted, David. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, I would. Being a journalist for a while um, gave me a shield um, for in, in my mind. Um, sometimes to not take a stand. Um, and uh, there are times when I could have spoken out more, I could have rattled the cage. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> that's uh hard stuff to reflect upon. Uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, like, like most of us, uh, I guess, uh, I think my MO is to stay in a comfort zone. And uh, so things that, uh, you know, kept me comfortable. I, I'd avoid things that made me uncomfortable. Um, and uh, to really take this on, it seems to me uh, almost necessitates to really take it on, being uncomfortable. You don't, you're not sure if your actions are um, effective or, uh, the best you're not sure if you're reading the situation right you're not sure if even your aspirations for uh, bringing uh, other people of other races into your life are, are welcome um, you know um, there's a lot to break through and so uh, being with the discomfort Uh, I think is a good place for me to uh, stay with right now. Um, and I would just reflecting back say that uh, in my earlier years, uh, I avoided that through various means. And one of them was, you know, the... <laughs> David Connelly, you'll understand, uh, and well, in, in some ways, right? The, the objectivity of journalism and, you know, not taking a too strong a stand on either one side, you know, not wanting to seem uh, skewed with your uh, reporting or whatever. But uh, there are ways uh, I, in journalism to get at that, but uh, that wasn't uppermost in my focus. 
and uh, I regret that. Stop there. Thanks, David. Uh, David. Okay. Could so I all of you, all of you. Oh, will, good, sorry, right, Robert. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Robert. Sorry, Robert. Sorry, Robert. Uh, thanks. Um, well, I, I, just in like uh, a minute or two, I'd like to give you my long view of this, uh, which is, um, as far as I understand, humans have been on this planet for about 900,000 years. And up until the last uh, approximately 100,000 years, all of our human predecessors lived in hunter-gatherer tribes. And just as we evolve and other creatures uh, evolve in physical ways, um, I think that we also evolve as humans psychologically. So the, the confessions that the other panelists have made um, strike me and which I am, you know, in the same boat. Um, I, I look at it a little bit like the smoke alarm analogy. So a smoke alarm in your house is calibrated so that it doesn't take much smoke at all for it to go off. And, and you might have experienced that like I do when I'm cooking sometimes, you know, it'll go off. It's so sensitive. That, I think, um, is some of our current behavior. Uh, white men towards, in the United States, towards people of color, is we've got this smoke alarm that, you know, sets off uh, a bad, a bad feeling. And, um, you know, what happens to a smoke alarm that goes off a lot? I don't know. Take out the battery. Um, so the hopeful part uh, of, of uh, my lawn view is that we will continue to evolve psychologically as well as physically. And that means there's a chance that we can evolve to be more accepting of people and not as people who are not in our tribe. So it's worth a try, but you know, it may take 10,000 years, or it might as well get started. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Bob. Well, I, um, I've heard each of you talk about the fact that you have had a series maybe of little mini revelations. And, you know, most of the time when we learn something new that is uncomfortable, what we do is we go to our brain and try and figure it out and try and work it out with, you know, all the things that we do with our brain to just try to figure it out. So my question to you is, in terms of your revelations, what do these new revelations do to your heart? I want you for a moment just to go to your heart and explain to the folks that will be listening to us and to each other, what does it do to your heart? Because I believe that unless it reaches our heart, there will be no change. Anybody can start. I, um, I, I can tell you, and, and it was, I'll tell you exactly what it did to my heart in, in, in this experience. The only thing I remember about 
um, the inauguration of Joe Biden on January 20th, 2020, was the poem um, read by, let's see, Aman uh, Amanda Gorham, I think is the poet's name. I cried like a baby. So that's the heart. Thanks. Thanks, Bob, very much for sharing that. Anybody like to go next? Uh, so uh, there's an ache, <clears throat> and uh, you know it's uh, it's just an ache. Uh, there's regret. I'm feeling some regret. Actually, <laughs> you know, David Tobin, um, you know, when he was talking, I was thinking about the classic case of what I would do different from what I was. I, I hadn't realized when I asked the question, I really have the classic case. I went into the journalism business thinking that open information was the answer. You know, you, you get all the information out, you get it out to everybody, and everybody will make the right decisions and everything will be all right. So when I'm at the Citizen and we get these letters to the editor from at Racists, my reaction, open press, I don't like it. They're, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it in those days. My reaction is, let's, we should run them. And we're the only newspaper in 200 miles who would run these things, but I want to get them out. And my, my rationale is I'm saying, look, those uh, the, what those guys are saying is happening around the dinner tables all over Auburn. What's new? It, it, it just, it's just, it's secret. Get it out. You know, and and uh, <laughs> uh, Gwen, Gwen Weber McLeod, our producer, was actually, she nailed me on this uh, at a panel 30 years ago. What happened was Auburn got a reputation for being open to racism. And um, what about 1991, 92, three, some, somewhere in there, we became <laughs> uh, a place for all these skinheads to show up and they had a demonstration. I, and I think Auburn re re requited themselves, acqu acquit re whatever the word is, very well, you know, and uh, it was perfect. They didn't come back. Nobody got hurt and, and nobody came back. But what I did do, you know, my, the answer is not information. The answer is the heart. And what I should have done and what Gwen told me 30 years ago was people were hurt. Every black person in town, every time they saw one of these letters, were in pain. The same satisfaction that all these racists were getting that brought us here. All the people of color here were in pain. I wouldn't, you know, it, what I learned, you know, about 1993, Equality Circles, the program that we put on some while at well, uh, go back. What I learned was about that pain. I realized that the experience of the person of color in, the, in Auburn was the daily humiliation, daily pain. I had no idea. And, you know, all I had to do was think about it, but I didn't know. But the, what would happen to me if every single day, you know, at my age, as I get older, people are going to start looking down on me and I'm going to start having a problem, I'm sure. But back in then, you know, this wouldn't happen to me. Well, the only, as close as it comes is somebody who drives too close behind me and I start getting pissed off with them because they're, they're, they're I think, you know, they, what they're, it's unsafe and why are they doing this? That's as close as I come. But it's not personal. In those days, it was personal. And, you know, being a journalist with that ideal, I, that with ideal, I was not, was was wrong. So, Dr. Nina, I don't have. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Oh, go ahead. Um, so, I don't have a lot to say in this regard. One of my personal challenges as a person, since I was very young, was getting out of my head. <laughs> I'm in my head a lot very thoughtful person, but uh, often I struggle, you know, with my heart. And what I do is I've adopted a phrase that uh, I picked up from uh, a, someone who's 
um, accomplished as a leader who, who said, stay in love. Stay in love with the people who are around you. Stay in love with what you do. Stay in love, you know, every moment. So where, where my heart rings is when I need a reminder to come back to the ground and be present and focused, it's stay in love. Where Stan? David? Um, one of the things, one of the <clears throat> privileges I have as a white man is uh, retreating when it gets uncomfortable or retreating from um, from the onslaught uh, that often comes day, to, day after day <clears throat> for people of color. Um, and uh, that's something I have to remind myself of continually. Um, earlier I said the, um, the big connection, the, this past, uh, during the COVID time was the connection of my heart. That's what I realized was missing in all my, um, my understanding, my thinking about race, my thinking about even the people that I know. Um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I can count on two hands, um, the people I consider friends who are people of color. And um, that's not, I, I don't consider that many at all. Um, but that's how my life has gone. And absent my efforts to change that, that's, that's the kind of circle I'm in um, and the lifestyle I'm in and the culture I'm in. Um, <clears throat> working with Brian through the campaign uh, was a real gift for me. Um, uh, it was his first campaign. It was my first work uh, helping manage a campaign. And uh, it was like a road trip, you know, with two, two acquaintances. And as we went along, we kept uh, encountering things, trying to figure out how to make it work. Uh, there were things that happened to him during the campaign. Um, you know, uh, a week before the election, uh, a tire was slit in his car in front of his house. Uh, accident, you know, I mean, just coincidence. <laughs> I, we're, you know, and, and he's a guy who navigates really well uh, between races. Uh, but uh, just in sharing stories like that road trip analogy, you know, we'd share stories. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you can really get close to somebody on a road trip and you can really bond heart to heart. And uh, it was just a, a beautiful gift. And, and I, I don't, I mean, there's no formula for getting there with people. I, I wish there was. Um, there was a, a great, uh, <clears throat> one of the books I read, uh, was a book from the seventies called the education of a wasp. I'll put it in the chat. It's by a white woman, uh, Lois Mark Stalvey. And, uh, in the seventies, she became aware of her white privilege, the racism around her, uh, she took uh, real clumsy, clumsy steps over and over and over again to thinking she was helping. Um, you know, so I, it's, it's, it's more complicated than uh, just getting acquaintances of color, but, or friends of color, or however we change this. But uh, being on the outside, uh, I think 
will forever keep us on the outside. And somehow, uh, you know, we have to dive in. That, so, And that's an issue of the heart for me. Thanks, David. The final question is, now that you have some insight on the Black experience, what is one action step you think you can take in your community, in your community? Hello. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, um, well, I, I, I consider uh, my community to be um, the United States. Um, <clears throat> and I, I've volunteered uh, in a couple of uh, U.S. Senate races, uh, uh, Doug Jones in Alabama. <clears throat> in 2017 and out in Nevada in 2018. And I, I have applied to be a uh, volunteer um, at wherever I might be needed um, to help uh, elect um, people to the U.S. Senate who are um, in support of uh, changing uh, the systematic racism in our country. So I hope they, you know, I hope I can, but I've applied. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bob. Anyone else can answer the question? You uh, have boxed me in with just one. Um, I've got a number, but I guess one that I have a real passion for, and Bob and I maybe ought to have lunch sometime to talk about this. I am convinced that if we don't make some fundamental changes to our political system, that we're, we're going down the tubes. And it, it goes back to the stranglehold that the two parties have on the political process. These two private parties, private organizations have on our system. And the, ex the extreme voices that you get left and right are not helpful, but they're the ones that get elected in the primaries in many cases and, and so forth. I mean, I'll, I'll say one nerdy thing and then I'll get off this. 83 of the congressional districts in this country are either red or blue. That means that if any given district, let's be generous and say 50% are either D or R, and 20% of the people vote in the primary, the more rabid, the more extreme and so forth. That means that 10% of the people that vote in the primary actually determine who's gonna win in the election in that either red or blue district. That, that, is, that is nuts. We need to change the incentives for politicians to solve problems and, and not be uh, so partisan. A anyway, so that, so, one of the things that I'm going to continue to do is push for political reform. I've become associated with Unite America. I'm going to reach out to some people. That's a national organization. Um, I'm going to continue to seek, uh, seek out people and uh, I'll start working a bit in New York. Um, but I'll just, one last thing. And that is that one very specific thing that, that would be very helpful in the country. It's happened in Alaska. It's happened in California. If you make the primaries nonpartisan, have one primary, you take the top four people uh, from the primary and go to a general election and either go to runoff or rank choice voting, you create an incentive for the politicians to appeal to the broadest audience and not just the extreme left or extreme right. And I, I believe that we'll be, we'll be more successful in solving problems like environment, poverty, you know, education, and so forth. Anyway, that, that would be, that's top of mind. Thanks, Dan. Two Davids, anyone want to bite? I'll go. Um, 
I, <clears throat> I've been involved in, uh, you know, campaigns elsewhere, but I find the greatest satisfaction for me is, and again, the best opportunity for me to connect with heart is local. And uh, so I'm, um, the action is the action that I feel I'm in the midst of is following things closely, looking for opportunities and using my writing um, to uh, call things out. Um, at the very least, and uh, wherever else that that exploration leads for my writing, I think there's a, an opportunity to, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's my opportunity for action. Thanks, David. David Conley, you want to add yours? Well, you and I have a project coming up. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, I'm I'm been thinking a lot about what I do with this this transparency that I'm offering, that I see about myself. I you know I might be a role model for some a few people anyway to think about it this way. I also might be helpful to people of color um, to hear from me and my perspective um, and to understand. I mean, I I think that. I think that that an attitude of demeaning anybody, uh, you have to bury it in yourself. Uh, I think it's perverting a person. I think it destroys their 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 sense of uh, self worth. I think all the terrible things go wrong when we we begin to demean anybody, and this is institutional. Uh, I have seems like I have some sales to be doing, and I think it's one on one. I don't know that I see myself as a lecturer by any means. And I'm, I am finishing a book that's going to force me to be going around lecturing. Uh, race isn't a, a part of it, but not a major part of it. But it will come up. I, I hope that's I hope that helps. I want to really thank you all, each and every one of you, for being as candid, as honest as you have been. I do believe that love is the most powerful energy in the universe. And I do believe um, being a black woman, uh, living in this country for as long as I have, having the opportunity to live outside of this country so I have a different perspective. But I do believe that it starts with revelations. But when it happens where people come together, it's because they come together with heart and with love and respect. I wanna thank you all for your courage I hope that you'd be willing to do this again sometime as we go along. But I really appreciate each and every one of you for your candor. And I thank the people that listened. And I will say good night. Thank you so much, David, Dan, David, and Robert. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, Nina, very much. <laughs>